Mr. Jones earned his Master of Laws in Taxation from the University of Florida College of Law in 1996, his Juris Doctorate from the University of Arkansas School of Law in 1995, and his Bachelor of Business Administration from Henderson State University in 1992. Please welcome Mr. Glendell Jones. Thank you guys so much for a very warm welcome. And a very happy good afternoon to each of you. On behalf of my wife Sharon and I, I just want to thank you all for the honor of standing before you today to talk about <clears throat> my desire to be president of Henderson State University. We're here today to share with you about ourselves, who we are, our philosophies on leadership, our philosophies on life, but also to hear questions you might have uh, concerning Henderson State University and my ability to lead this university. Could you get any farther back today? <laughs> Don't worry, I'll just keep inching up. I am joined today by my wife Sharon of 16 years. Sharon is a product of Emerson, Arkansas, down south of Magnolia. So she's a product of South Arkansas and knows this area very well. And of course, she lived here for two years from 2000 to 2002, where our daughter Camille was actually born in Benton, delivered in Benton, but actually raised here in Arkadelphia for a couple of years. Camille's 11 years old. She's a very beautiful, graceful ballerina. She's about five feet, two inches tall, been dancing for about six years now, seven years now and just is a pure work of art. Very bright, very intelligent, just very graceful to watch. Cameron is our six-year-old son, is in the first grade, and he is a piece of work. <coughs> and, and every stereotype about a six-year-old boy that just ran through your mind, it's true. But a super kid, we are blessed with two great kids who are doing some very fantastic things. Again, it's an honor to be here today. It's been a long day, but it's been a very exciting day. I've been looking forward to the opportunity to address the faculty. I know you have many concerns, and I know you have many, many, many things to, to inquire about concerning the university and where it's heading. I just want to share about myself a little bit, and then about my leadership style and philosophy, and then just share some thoughts in terms of where I think Henderson will go in the future, uh, if I were blessed. Uh, to be chosen to be the next president of Henderson State University. <clears throat> I'm from Blyville, Arkansas, which is a small community of about 15,000 people, northeast Arkansas, right on, on Interstate 55, about an hour north of Memphis, the last town you hit in Arkansas before you go into Missouri. I was a first-generation college student. My parents didn't finish high school. My grandfather made it to the fifth grade. My grandmother made it to the fourth grade. It was in that environment in which I was raised where I was taught certain things. Number one, to work hard. We come from just, we're just blue collar people who believe in working hard. We believe in being people of great character and integrity. That was modeled before me day in and day out. We we're going to honor our word and we're going to be who we said we were going to be. But also they instilled in myself and my sister a desire to be educated. And they would tell us over and over and over and over again, if you want a better life, you've got to become educated. You've got to take your classwork seriously. And we're going to expect you to excel. Not because they knew much about what it meant to excel in school, but they truly believed that if we worked hard, that we had the gifts and the ability to be successful. And because of that, I'm so thankful. My grandfather was one of my big heroes in life. He passed about five years ago. And I got a chance to speak at his funeral. And one of the highlights of my life, I got to talk about my hero. I got to talk about how he set the example for me every day as a construction worker. He would arise at the crack of dawn. He'd work all day. He'd work into the night sometimes. He'd come home dusty, tired. He'd take a bath. He'd eat dinner. He'd wake up and do it all over again, never complain never whine, never miss a day of work, but would always tell me, you've got to work hard in life. You've got to work hard in life. And so when I think of the three institutions that have framed me and that have shaped my life, it first starts with my family. Today, my family's expanded. And as a first-generation college student, I was able to go on and earn a degree from Henderson State University. My sister followed two years after me and earned a degree here as well. 
have a cousin who's earned a degree from Henderson State University at the same time I did, and then I had two other family members subsequently have earned degrees from Henderson State University. This university means a lot to us. The second great institution that's shaped me along the way has been my faith. I am where I am because of the grace of God and nothing else. Not because of anything I've done, but because God has just been very good to us. Uh, my role in life is not to proselytize the people with whom I work. My role in life is not to go out and seek converts. My role in life is to honor what I've been called to do, and that's to love other people and to serve them in every opportunity I have. And so my wife and I view our journey in higher, higher education over the past 16 years, not as a job, but as a calling. And whether it's five in the morning celebrating the birth of a new child, or walking with a colleague in the death of a parent, or celebrating the highest of highs in terms of our successes, we're called to walk alongside of those with whom we serve. My family introduced me to my faith, and it was my faith that brought me to Henderson in 1988 as a student on a football scholarship. I've been recruited by the legendary Ralph Sporty Carpenter. And I remember the day he was sitting in my living room convincing me that this, there was this jewel down in South Arkansas called Henderson State University. And forget Arkansas State University, forget Southeast Missouri State University, forget Memphis State University. This is where you want to be because our campus is made for you. And I'm thinking this guy is out of his mind. I'd never heard of Henderson, I'd never heard of Arkadelphia. But he said, just come and visit. And just come look us over and see what you think. And I remember his conversation as if it was yesterday. My mom only had one question the entire time he was in our home. He said, if something happens to my son, will you take care of him? He said, yes, Miss Jones, I will. Well, I came down for a visit. I fell in love with this campus. It was quiet. It was beautiful. I'd met a few professors, they were nice, they seemed to be welcoming to me, and this is where I knew I wanted to be. So I came here in July of 1988, 18 years old, and this Coach Carpenter used to say I was full of vim, vigor, and vitality. And within four days, I was in the hospital, I'm very sick. I had an inflamed liver, I had dehydration issues, I was in the hospital almost two weeks. And every day, being true to his word, Coach Carpenter came by to check on me. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And about the fifth day I was in the hospital, I determined I couldn't do it anymore. I felt like I was going to die, and I just wanted to go home. And so my mom had called that afternoon. We were talking. I'm crying on the phone. She's crying on the phone. I said, you know, I think I'm just ready to give it up and come home. And she said, you know what? I think you're right. Why don't you just come on home? And Coach Carpenter had walked in the room about that time. He heard our conversation. And he took the phone away from my hand. And I'll never forget these words. Mrs. Jones, with all due respect, he can die just as well down here as he can up in Blytheville. <laughs> it's just time for your little boy to grow up. I told you I was going to take care of him, and I'm going to take care of him. And to his word, he did. And to his credit, he did. And I'm thankful he did, because if I had gone home, I never would have gone back. I would not have gone back. And I learned a lot during that time. And so I'm here today for multiple reasons. Number one, I'm here to say thank you. Thank you for educating me. Thank you for investing in me. Thank you for affirming in me the values that my parents taught me. But also thank you for inspiring me to reach for the stars. When I left Henderson in 1992, I felt there was absolutely, positively nothing that I could do. Because you encouraged me, you challenged me, you brought out things within me that I did not know existed. And just when I thought I was getting good, another challenge would come my way. I'll never forget Don Dotson, my very first accounting professor. For those of you who don't know Don Dotson, he's about this tall, and it's as mean as a snake on a hot summer day. And Dr. Dotson was just the kind of person who would walk into a classroom and say, you know what, let's just save us all a lot of time. Those of you who don't feel like working, just drop now, and I can teach the ones that want to be here. Never thought that was a very effective recruitment strategy, 
but nobody had left, so we stayed. And the first exam, I remember, he's going around handing out the exams for us to, for, to take that day, and he places the exam on my desk and says, young man, put that pen away and pull out a pencil. Now, I don't know what was happening in the Blywell School District, but between the second grade and the time I graduated, I only wrote with a pen, and nobody ever said a thing about it, so I only wrote with pens. He said, young man, would you please put that pen away and pull out the pencil? I said, well, I only write with pens. I don't have any pencils. You need to take the exam with the pencil. Well, I don't write with pencils. I only write with pens. He says, okay, what are you going to do when you make a mistake? And again, I was 18 years old. And without thinking, it came out, I don't plan on making any mistakes. <laughs> he said, we'll see. And I remember thinking, oh, Lord, I've never asked for a perfect anything in my life. But if you don't mind, this one time, give me a perfect score. He passes the exam out. A couple weeks later, perfect score. He goes, okay, from here on out, everything below a 96 will be a B for you. I said, you can't do that. He goes, watch me. Next exam, I made a 95, and he wrote the biggest red B I've ever seen in my life on my paper. And I remember going to complain to the dean. as Dr. Fisher at the time. Dr. Fisher, I know you don't know me, but I'm a student here, and I've been wronged by one of your faculty members. Well, what happened? I told him the story. He said, do you have the paper with you? Oh, yes, sir, I do. I handed him the paper. He looked at the paper. He turned it sideways. He looked at it again. He turned it sideways. He goes, yeah, that's a B. I said, no, to be, what are you going to do about it? He said, I'm going to give you the best advice I can give you right now. So what's that? Make a 96 next time. <laughs> and as frustrating as it was that day, he challenged me because he believed that I could do far more than I thought I could. Fast forward, when I graduated as a senior, I was nominated for the Arkansas Bankers Association Scholarship. It's a $4,000, $4,500 scholarship. They only give one a year. Don Dotson nominated me for that particular scholarship. Other professors in the College of Business were asking me about, are you prepared? Are you ready? Have you thought about this question? Because there was an interview process that would determine who got the scholarship. On the Friday before the Saturday interview, Dr. Dotson called me into his office and said, look, I noticed you hadn't worn a tie around campus. I said, well, I don't have any ties. I don't come from a professional family. I wouldn't know what to buy if I had to buy one. He said, look, I want you to win this thing tomorrow. And I've bought you a tie, and I want you to wear this tie tomorrow. And when you go in there, I want you to understand one thing. You're better than anybody in that room because you're from Henderson. You're prepared. You're ready. And you just need to believe that. And I walked in the next day. I won the scholarship. And Henderson, when I left Henderson, again, I just felt that I could do anything. And I owe so much of that to you all here today. I'm looking at a lot of familiar faces as I look around the room. I think I'm looking at my former history professor who really inspired me to really think about things in a different manner. And so I'm so grateful and I'm humbled to stand before you. You guys have no idea how you've impacted my life and the influence you've had on me. And I wanted me to be mindful to say thank you. But I also want to be mindful to let you know I'm here because I desire to be the president of Henderson State University. My wife and I have been in Jonesboro for 10 years, and for 10 years we've gotten phone calls about looking at this opportunity and looking at that opportunity, and we concluded if we were going to leave Jonesboro, it had to be something significantly better than what ASU had to offer, something significantly better that would cause us to really reassess where we are in life and to where we could really go somewhere and truly make a difference in the lives of people. And we believe this is that opportunity. We believe Henderson is the right place. We believe Henderson is the right place time. We believe Henderson has the right mission, and we believe we're the right fit for this campus. Henderson has an incredible history of doing a lot of tremendous things. And I think the future for Henderson is even brighter. The potential on the horizon is even greater as we look at the national landscape as it relates to education in general in our country, as we look at our state, and there's a significant push to educate more citizens within our state as we look at the current state of higher education, the state's funding less and less, but yet we're being asked to do more and more. And I think we have an incredible opportunity to reach the next generation of future readies and beyond with this powerful tool that we call education. From my standpoint, when I look at Henderson, I see 
just this incredible shining jewel down in South Arkansas, probably the best kept secret in our state. I've looked at some of your backgrounds and they are tremendous. You come from some of the best schools out there. I've read some of your works, which are tremendous. And I think Henderson is very blessed and honored to have you as a part of the faculty here as well. I know there are a few students that are here and we're glad to have you all as well. When I look at Henderson, I love your mission. In a world of sound bites, in a world of pundits telling us what we should think and how we should feel about everything, it's refreshing to be on the campus of a university that says, you know what, we're going to challenge our students to do more and be more. We want thinkers. We want communicators. We want people who understand and value difference. Yes, we want you to master your discipline, but we want you to take those skill sets and we want you to be a leader in our world, in our country in your homes and in your communities. And I think the public liberal arts mission is exactly what's needed today. When I see so many students, I hear from so many employers who say, I just need a kid who can think. I can't tell everybody what to do. Is there anyone teaching kids how to think? I ask you within the past month, how many times have you been somewhere and you've had a frustrating experience and you walked away and you said this, what were they thinking? What were they thinking? And so I think that unique mission, which is unlike any other university in the state of Arkansas, creates a significant opportunity for us. I think our ability to articulate that mission, I think our ability to make certain that the 18-year-old and their parent can understand the relevancy of that mission or the transfer student, I think it's very important. But it's the right mission. How many jobs 10 years ago that we see now didn't exist 10 years ago? A significant number. How many jobs will exist tomorrow that we don't even know about right now? How many people stay their entire career in one job? Not many. And that ability to transition throughout life, that ability to take the knowledge that you have and to begin to apply it, thinking critically, beginning to engage in, in just logical reasoning, but also thinking about how you go about analyzing information that you see so that you can make that informed choice and participate as an informed citizen in our world, I think is very important. I think my personality is the right fit for this campus. Uh, my style of leadership is very simple. I am a servant leader. And what that means is that I simply lead by serving and meeting the needs of others. I do not believe the university is about me. I do not believe it's about what I want or what I would desire. I think it's about supporting the success of those around me. I believe it's about securing resources to unlock the passions that exist within many of you, the dreams and ambitions that you have, the neat things that you would love to try if you only had the ability to do so. My style itself is one of very consultative, very facilitative. Um, I like to engage people in that decision-making process. Shared governance is something I live each and every day. We completely reinvented our system on our campus about four years ago to where now it's students, it's faculty, it's staff who are involved in that core decision-making process through a web of networks that we call shared governance and the various committees we have in place, but also the fact that we sit down and have dialogue all the time about the concerns and how we're going to go about solving the problems that exist. I believe that universities are first and foremost about people, and I believe that every person counts. And I think we have to remember that people are not coming looking for a job or an education, but in case of faculty, they're not coming just looking for a job. They're coming to look for a place to build their career or to continue their career. And that's a very big difference. And our ability to extend appreciation to people, our ability to support their efforts, our ability to commend them when they do well, but also our ability to reward them for the excellence they exhibit is very important to me. Likewise, there are a lot of important functions that are formed at the, performed at the university. But in the end, we can never forget that it's all about the students. We're here because we want to educate students. And I think our ability to create that student-centered learning environment, both within our classroom and connecting what's happening within our classroom to the experiences they have outside of the classroom, I think will be very important. And whether it's service learning, uh, other engagement activities, I think it's going to be very important that we're able to distinguish ourselves based upon the impact that we have on our students when they come here. When I think of Henderson State University, 
I see a university that has incredible potential. You're doing a lot of great things. But I think you have a potential to do even greater things moving forward. When I look at the university itself, I see a university that, from an image standpoint, I think it's time for us to really look at how we go about raising our profile. It's a great university. But how do we go about telling the world about what exists here at Henderson State University? How do we make certain that when we appear in a national ranking that it's truly reflective of who we are and the capabilities that exist here, whether it's U.S. News and World Reports or any other publication that would list and suggest who we are? When I look at Henderson and the landscape of our state with funding being diminished the way it is coming from our state, I think it's important that we work very diligently to maintain, if not enhance, the current funding streams that we do have from the state. That's a very significant source of revenue that we receive. Now, Arkansas is moving towards performance-based funding. I think it's going to be important that we align the university to be very competitive in all of those factors that will come forward. Graduation rates, persistent rates, persistence rates in particular. Likewise, I think the university is poised for a very strong and very strategic enrollment management plan. You've had some growth over the past few years. And the question now becomes, where do we want to go with enrollment? How big do we want to be? What students are we seeking? Um, right now, I think the ACT requirements for admission is 18, it's an ACT of 18 or a 2.5 GPA and an upper half of your class. What are we trying to grow? And who are we trying to reach moving forward? And what will be that plan? Because as we grow the university, it creates a need for other services. I had a great session with the students a minute ago. And and clearly, while I've never lived in them, Newberry and Smith Hall are not very popular these days. But again, thinking about how we're going to look years from now as a university, I think it's going to be very important. Likewise, I think we're positioned for a capital campaign that could be truly transformative for this campus. And a capital campaign that really has three themes. Number one, student scholarships is that as we have more private support coming in to cover student scholarships, that frees up the E&G dollars we're currently committing to scholarships to make available for other resources. And whether that's investing in increasing faculty salaries or launching new programs, it creates an opportunity. And people love to give to students. They love the success story of knowing that their dollars have made a difference in the life of a young person. Likewise, likewise, endowed professorships and endowed chairs are very important. As we seek to attract and retain the very best and brightest faculty in America, it's going to be important that we have resources in place to be able to do that. And number three, we need to enhance some of our facilities. Uh, clearly, this is a beautiful campus. Clearly, it has a lot of great facilities, but also it's clear that we have a lot of deferred maintenance needs that we're going to have to address in the future. But also, there are some of our structures that I've been told are somewhat inadequate for their current use. And so that's going to be important moving forward, the capital campaign that we're able to launch. But when I think of Henderson, I think of an opportunity to create an institution that would be an institution of choice for students in South Arkansas, but also throughout our state. I think of an institution where we're known for the strength of our faculty and the quality of our academic programs. I see a place where people would want to come to work here because of the family environment that we create and because of the support infrastructure that they have. A lot of people tend to think that the number one determinant of whether or not a person takes a job is salary. It's not salary. It's not salary. It's our ability to communicate to them that they're going to come and be a part of something special, that they'll be mentored, they'll be supported, they'll be encouraged. We're about to uh, announce the hiring of a dean at ASU, a person that has incre an incredible academic background, unbelievable. And I was talking to her the other night. She goes, you know what? I think you guys have convinced me. I want to come there. I said, well, what, what sold you? I said, Glenn, it's the people there. I, I can't find that anywhere else. Yes, somebody else can pay me more money, but the people there are just fantastic. And I think the people here are equally fantastic, if not more fantastic. When I think of recruiting students, when I think of recruiting faculty and staff, my philosophy is very simple. I want to put people together with people. If I can get you to Jonesboro, Arkansas, we're going to recruit you to ASU. We're just that confident. Simply because 
we know, our friends in the community, we know our friends throughout the campus will do whatever we can to help make certain every person feels comfortable when they come to our campus. And that's been very important to us moving forward. I also think when I look at Henderson State University, I see a university that will be seen by the state as being vitally important to the state of Arkansas, both from an educational standpoint, but also from, from an economic development standpoint down here in South Arkansas. I think we can own South Arkansas in terms of student enrollment. There is no institution near us that, that compares to what Henderson has to offer. And I think our ability to be strategic in how we go about enrollment, our ability to be strategic in how we go about our capital campaign, our ability and willingness to be strategic in how we go about marketing the university will all be important and will all determine how successful we are moving forward. When I talk about enhancing enrollment, I'm not talking about opening the doors and just having whoever, whosoever will come in. I'm talking about thinking about the quality of students we want to have at our university moving forward and then a process that we'll put in place to go about recruiting those students to our campus. At ASU, about five years ago, we had an honors college that had about 150 students and maybe 200 in a good year. We determined that we wanted to have more higher achieving students on our campus. You fast forward, last fall we had 769 students in our honors program. Last year we admitted 239 students into our honors program, average ACT of 28, average GPA of 3.85. They came from all over the state of Arkansas. And the reason they chose ASU, and they said this almost unanimously, was simply this. They knew that we wanted them there. It wasn't the level of scholarship we offered. It wasn't the fancy housing. It wasn't any of those things. And I think those things were factors. But at the end of the day, it was the fact that they knew that they had a group of people on that campus who cared about them and cared about their future. And here at Henderson, I think our ability to be successful moving forward will hinge directly upon our people. And stated even more succinctly, the ability of this university to move forward is going to be directly dependent upon the faculty that we have on this campus. You all deliver what we do, and that is you deliver an educational experience to our students in the classroom, as mentors, as advisors. And the value you bring to this university, to borrow the old visa commercial, is priceless. And I recognize that and I understand that. And so I want to take a moment to commend you all for the work that you do each and every day. I'm well aware that if I read the numbers correctly, that for the past five years you've not gotten any pay raise. You are the non-classified staff. And I know that that places a damper on things. But despite that, you continue to excel. Despite that, you continue to move forward each and every day. And despite that, you continue to show up and engage and exhibit excellence in our classroom. And I thank you for that. Because your passion is still there. And where there's passion, great things can happen. And so on behalf of my wife and I, I just want to thank you again for allowing us to be here. I want to thank you for giving me a few moments just to talk about myself, and I would welcome the opportunity to answer any questions you all might have. Could you uh, give us an idea of, of how you would begin mounting a capital campaign? The first thing I would do is I would engage one of the national consulting firms to work with us. Because the first thing that we're going to have to do is determine what our capabilities are. I think the advancement staff here is very small. From what I recall, there are only one or two people. And I think we need to think about how we would go about approaching a capital campaign in a manner that makes sense for Henderson State University. At ASU, we're halfway through a $100 million capital campaign. We're still in the silent phases. We're going to go public next year. But the support team we have in place there is, in terms of number, significantly greater than the support team you have here in place here. And so I think we're going to have to take a step back to think about going forward. And I, my idea, if I were to be here, would really to, to coincide with the uh, 125th anniversary of the university. So in 2015, to really think, sorry, yeah, 2015, to really think about now how we would go about ramping up for that and what would be required. In the process of doing that, 
uh, our capital campaign is, is really built around faculty. It's built around a sort of academic components. It's built around scholarships. It's built around endowed professorships. And it's built around academic facilities. I mean, that's it. And, and so we've gone out to all of our colleges. We have an advancement officer assigned to every college to understand what those needs are. And we're taking those needs and we're beginning to place those in front of our different donors, both individuals but also some of our partners that we have who are foundations as well and corporate entities. And we're beginning to make a significant amount of progress. But the capital campaign, when you think of our university and you think of enhancing funding streams, <coughs> A capital campaign is central to that, but it's not the only piece. We can't forget the fact that we've got significant dollars coming in from the state. We can't forget the fact that as we enhance enrollment, that enhances opportunities as well. But also we can't forget the fact that when it, where it makes sense, where it makes sense, looking at grant-funded opportunities as well. Uh, you guys have a great grant from the Rockefeller Foundation where you're reaching high school kids and junior high kids to, to really move them into the higher ed pipeline. In fact, we. We, with your permission, we just borrowed that idea, and we received a $200,000 grant from them about a year or so ago. But it was your idea, and it was an excellent idea, because if one of the issues you're facing, if the kids coming out of high school are not performing at the rate we need them to be performing at prior to coming into Henderson, then the question becomes, how do we reach out into the high schools and beyond to help prepare those students for higher education down the road? I'll ask my standard question. What is your favorite TV show? What is your favorite movie? What plays or concerts have you been to recently? Favorite TV show? Oh, wow. My kids have me so brainwashed, I think of what my favorite TV show is. My favorite TV show is probably Deadliest Catch. I don't watch much TV, okay? This is about the crab fisherman. And it's just, yeah, I just appreciate crab legs now, knowing what they go through. But I don't watch a lot of TV, but that's, in terms of things that are out there now, that's one I try to DVR from time to time. But probably my all-time favorite is still Andy Griffith. My kids like Andy Griffith. In fact, my son, um, oh, bless his heart. Can I tell the story? Okay. Cameron came home, they wrote these books or they developed a book in class, each kid wrote a page and the teacher had the books bound and copied and he had two books that Sharon bought for him to bring home. We only brought one book home. And so she called the teacher, where's Cameron's other book? Well, he kept trying to give me one book back, but I sent him home with two, I promise you. And finally, he broke yesterday morning and uh, turns out there's this bully of a girl in the third grade that took his book from him. So how do you let her take your book? And we had watched the Andy Griffith episode where Opie was bullied by the kid for his milk money. And we're going to watch it again when I get back tomorrow night. But <clears throat> that's probably my favorite TV show because it teaches so many life lessons. Favorite movie? The clean version of My Cousin Vinny. It's, just, it's a lawyer's movie. And it was just split to her side. But there's just some lines in that movie that are just completely comical. Uh, like the line where, well, it, there's just a lot of great lines in the movie. But, <laughs> but from time to time, I'll, I'll quote Joe Pesci around the campus, but he just has a, a lot of great lines. Very, very funny movie. Uh, oh, what's another movie I really like? Uh, I like all the old Western movies, but don't do a lot of TV, not a whole lot of movies, but My Cousin Vinny comes to mind, especially the scene where he walks into the diner and the guy takes a big piece of lard and he throws it on the fryer and it starts shh. And he looks up and goes, haven't you people heard about the ongoing battle against cholesterol down here? And the guy looks at him and goes, apparently not. So, But those are things I watch. What favorite TV show, favorite movie, last play or concert I've gone to. Last concert was Chris Tomlin. He's a contemporary Christian artist. He was phenomenal, sold out the convo, had about 10,000 people there. And before that, we went to see Lady Ann Dellum, and which was OK. Two years before that, Reba McIntyre came to town, and she was just awesome. Just awesome. I'm a contemporary country. I'm sorry, I'm a classic country fan, not a big fan of the contemporary stuff. But we had donors that wanted to go see Lady Antebellum. So guess what? We went to see Lady Antebellum. <clears throat> and we had to grin and bear it, but they were OK. They were OK. We have a program known as the uh, Delta Symposium, where we have great 
writers and poets from around the country who'll come in and they'll spend almost four days on campus talking about the literature, talking about the works of art. And a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of introducing a lady by the name of Natasha Trethway, who within poet circles is very well known, but I'd never heard of her, but I said, look, I was told to introduce her, so I did. Very nice lady, bought some of her work. The following Monday, she won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. And I wrote her a note and said, congratulations, I think there's magic in the fact that I'm introducing you and you happen to win the Pulitzer. She writes me back, I don't think so. <laughs> And she's gone on to become a very nice friend. But, but mainly, the things I watch are really a lot of kids' shows. Whatever our kids want to watch is typically what we're watching. Well, you mentioned uh, you know, the uh, performance-based funding. Um, and I guess my question to you is, how do we b balance the need for more graduates with upholding our academic standards? It seems like, you know, well, I mean, I guess the, uh, you know, there's this sort of obvious possibility of pressure to lower our standards to, you know, generate more graduates. What do you think about that? I spent all last summer working with the Committee on Performance-Based Funding, as did uh, Bobby Jones here from Henderson. And by the way, let me just take a moment to publicly acknowledge Bobby's work on behalf of Henderson. He's been a great ambassador. He's done some great work. He's been a gem of a person to work with in Little Rock and definitely worked very hard on behalf of Henderson. I was a part of the writing group that actually wrote the report to the governor. And the only section that was not changed from beginning to end was a section I wrote on academic quality. We cannot sacrifice academic quality. And we tried to make it very clear that we will do all that we can to support students, to mentor students, to tutor students, to make certain we had a web of services in place that would enhance the likelihood for them to be successful. But at the end of the day, it falls back on the student. And right now in Arkansas and other states, higher education is almost viewed as a commodity. I paid my money, therefore I should get a degree. And we're almost viewed as kind of like Walmart. And I always tell people, if you want to view us as a business, view us as a fitness center. I paid my money, but that doesn't drop 20 pounds. I paid my money, but that doesn't gain me an ounce of muscle. You paid your money, you came in, we gave you a great plan. We provided you with all the support and all the resources you needed. But at the end of the day, you have to take that step. You have to lift the weights. You're going to have to be intimately involved in this process. And so when I think of performance funding, I think it will be important that we look at those different measurements to make certain that we can be competitive. But we are not going to diminish our standards in any way. We're not giving away degrees. We're not selling degrees. If we're chastised for it, we just get chastised. But I think the moment we start giving away degrees, we're no different than some of these for-profit institutions that are out there where if you write your check, you get a degree. And yet you've got a lot of people out there trying to justify the fact that they've got a quality degree, but they can't get a job. The reputation of Henderson is very strong, and I would not do anything that would in any way tarnish or diminish the work that's gone on before I got here, but the work that would, be follow, the work that would follow me once I were to leave at some point in time. mentioned um, capital campaign in terms of uh, raising dollars. And I am a grant writer for the TRIO programs. What percentage of funding do you feel from um, federal government should come into uh, public university? And then a second part question is, as president, what role would you take in terms of uh, regional leadership? In terms of funding, I don't have a percentage in mind. A lot of that is, again, understanding the capability of the university, what we have in place. At ASU, I'm responsible for all of our federal relationships. I work with Senator Pryor. I work with Senator <coughs> Bozeman. I work with Congressman Crawford, who's our first congressional district rep. 
Over the past five years, we've brought in, gosh, in excess of $35 million in federal funding to ASU. Uh, and it, it's been a very successful, coordinated effort. And so I don't know what that percentage is, but we just have to determine what makes sense for Henderson. Now, ASU, I've got an Arkansas Biosciences Institute on our campus that gets about three and a half to four million dollars from the state. So we're able to do things that other institutions simply cannot do. And so I'm very quick to make certain that I convey that to everyone, that I would not try to come here and recreate what's at ASU because they're two completely different institutions. But there are funding opportunities available out there, and I think it will be imperative for us to really be proactive in securing that support. From a regional leadership perspective, I think the, leader, the university has to be one of the recognized leaders in southwest Arkansas or south Arkansas altogether. What I love about Jonesboro, Arkansas is that everything is built around ASU. In 2008, when everyone was announcing and telling the world how bad the economies were and people were losing jobs, two things happened in Jonesboro within six weeks of each other. First of all, Nordex, the German windmill manufacturer, announced that they were going to locate a facility in the U.S. in Jonesboro, Arkansas, bringing 700 jobs. A few weeks after that, nice pack, if you ever used a wet wipe to clean your hands, a sani wipe, that's a company that makes those. They may sell it under a different brand, but they relocated the first facility in 25 years. They built the first new facility in 25 years in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Didn't build it, they acquired an facility, existing facility, bringing 300 jobs. Prior to that, Alberto Culver, St. Ives Lotion, Motion Shampoo, all those things you probably use, came to Jonesboro the year before that, bringing about 400 jobs with them. And in each instance, publicly, the leaders of those companies said the number one factor in their decision to relocate was Arkansas State University because they knew that they would have the ability to attract a skilled workforce. And not only that, but they have access to our alumni network when they're trying to fill positions. And so when they have a job that needs to be filled, we send it out to our 65,000 plus alumni, many of whom would love to come back to Jonesboro and have come back to Jonesboro. As South Arkansas goes, so will Henderson. And I think it's going to be important that as an educational leadership, as an educational entity, that we take the leadership role because we're that neutral observer that nobody's threatened by. We work well with our chamber, we work well with our local industrial council, we work well with other communities around Northeast Arkansas, because whether a facility goes into Blyville or Marion or West Memphis or Newport or Walnut Ridge, and these are all communities surrounding Jonesboro, Paragold, we all win. We all win. I know on this campus many people work here but live, live elsewhere. And so from our standpoint, I think it's going to be important that we reach out and really engage <coughs> the leadership and to make certain that we're walking forward with a coordinated, coordinated effort to really promote the interests of South Arkansas and indirectly, and if not directly, promoting Henderson State as well. Likewise, along regional leadership, I think you're going to have an incredible opportunity to create some great relationships with two-year campuses that I don't think you have right now. One of my responsibilities at ASU is to work with our two-year campuses in our region. And we're delivering programs, not only at our three ASU-affiliated campuses, but in Blyville with Arkansas Northeastern College, Mid-South Community College in West Memphis, with East Arkansas Community College in Forest City, with, uh, oh, they would kick me to this day. They're in Melbourne, oh, one of our newer partners, beginning to work more with Black River Tech. So we're being able to create those kind of partnerships, knowing that many of the students that we're trying to serve simply cannot drive to Jonesboro, Arkansas to take a course and drive home. And they cannot afford to relocate to Jonesboro because they have existing jobs and family commitments. And so what we try to do is simply ask ourselves, how do we build a better mousetrap? And how do we take our academic programs without sacrificing any degree of quality and begin to take those elsewhere <clears throat> to enable people to earn a college degree? And so on our campus, we promote accreditation uh, religiously. It's very important from our standpoint that every program that has an accreditation available achieves that accreditation because that's one of those objective marks of quality. Do you have an accredited program? And whether it's music, whether it's business, engineering in our case, whether it's our nursing programs, uh, athletic training, uh, NK and teacher ed and education in general, it's very important that we bear all of the signature marks of quality.
My question has to do with your, what do you perceive that your relationship would be with the school of business? Um, would you treat them uh, the same as any other part of the institution? And the second part is, uh, do you think you would micromanage uh, the business school? No. <laughs> And Dr. Jeff, I say this with all love and affection, they will be treated like any other college. You cannot play favorites. There are too many strong colleges on this campus, Teachers College, Arts and Sciences, uh, Business. It's just, you can't just begin to pick out favorites, in my opinion. There are too many deans that are doing too many great things, and I think to do that would just be dumb. I don't have a better way of saying that part. It would just be dumb. Micromanaging, I do not micromanage. You will find that I will move heaven and earth to find the very best people for this campus to come in and serve as faculty members, administrators, staff members, whatever it may be. We'll work to empower and equip those individuals with the resources they need to be successful. And then we let them lead. I don't have the time, energy, or desire to micromanage people every day. Now, what we do on our campus with our deans is very simple. We paint parameters. We don't run a file of our budget. We don't do anything that would damage the integrity of this institution in any way or at any level. We take care of our students at all costs. Likewise, we protect the integrity of our academic programs. Within that, we need your expertise. I am not an expert on history. Dr. Graves is. And I recognize that, and I know that. So it would be completely foolish of me to step in and say, you guys are running your programs the wrong way, or you guys should do this as opposed to that. I will give ideas, I will work with our deans, I will work with our provost, but I do not micromanage at all. I think that is just very, it's a poor use of resources, it's very inefficient, and it's very ineffective. But also, I think it's very demeaning to the people with whom you work. If I don't trust you to do the job, then you shouldn't have the job. But once we bring you on, from my perspective, I'm going to trust you until you give me a reason not to trust you. And typically, if you go outside of one of those four parameters, that's typically when I have my reason not to trust you. But I've never had an issue with the dean or a department chair in terms of anyone running a file of anything like that. But we don't micromanage on our home campus. I've taught in the College of Business there. I know a lot of the faculty members there. I value them greatly, but they know they're going to get the same answer as anyone else gets. Because again, you have to be fair and balanced along the way. Uh, based on your statement a minute ago, our business professors make twice as much as our science professors. Uh, are you going to double the science professor's salaries, or are you going to cut the business professor's salaries? Could you load that question any more right now? <laughs> I would much rather work to double the salaries of everyone else. I understand that there is an issue with those particular salaries. Uh, at the same time, I want to be mindful of the fact that as we talk about salaries and as we talk about concerns, that we don't forget the fact that there are people behind those salaries. And I don't want to create any kind of environment that would hurt, demean, or belittle anyone in any way. But at the same time, I do recognize that there are people on this campus that are doing great things. And for four of the past five years, have not received any appreciation from a financial standpoint of the efforts that you've undertaken. And so one of the things I would begin to work on initially is just to simply ask and think about how do we create a situation where we can enhance revenues that are coming into this university so that we can appropriately compensate our people to reflect the fact that we do value them and the contributions that they're making. Of our sister, our 
sister institutions, not really sisters, but other universities in the state have pretty heavy, aggressive marketing campaigns. Uh, what is your philosophy about media marketing and what kind of plan would you have to put such a marketing in place? I think you're going to have to have a more aggressive marketing plan than you have. Word of mouth is important, word of mouth is good. But we have to understand how people come to learn about universities. And we're recruiting students today that are very, very technologically savvy. Um, bought my 11-year-old an iPad, iPod Touch for Christmas, which is kind of like an iPhone, but you can't call out and it's a lot cheaper. And she wanted an iPhone, so there's no way I'm buying an iPhone for an 11-year-old. You forget about it. <clears throat> but we bought her this iPod Touch. Her friend had one, thinking she'd be okay with it. And she was very happy, very grateful, very appreciative. I was at work one day, and I looked down, I got a call. It's from an unknown number, and I normally don't take those, but I took it that day. And, hey, Dad, how are you? Uh, where are you? I'm at home. Calling from my iPod Touch. So how'd you do that? Well, I found that an app that allows you to do text messaging, then for $1.49 more, I had given her a little gift card, for $1.49 more I could buy an upgrade that allows me to call people. I said, get out of here. <laughs> At this point I'm feeling dumb because I know what I'm paying a month for my iPhone. I'm thinking. But kids like that, they receive information in different ways. A lot of our incoming freshmen are looking for people to connect with them at different points along that continuum. And that's where I think the enrollment management plan and the marketing plan really have to dovetail very nicely together. We can tell you exactly how many times our prospective freshman has been touched since uh, October, let's say. He's gotten a letter from the chair, he's gotten a letter from the dean, he's gotten on and on and on and on. And it's very important that we're monitoring that, but also the generation of students coming up today, they don't know Henderson State University. They don't know Arkansas State University very well which is why we're so aggressive getting our name out there and making certain that they understand that we have a lot of what they would desire. And what we do is that we promote and push our academic programs. And when we get our students on campus, I'll go and do a welcome to the parents, but they're not there to see me. They're there to see you all. They want to know, tell me about this biology professor. I'm interested in pre-med and I want to be a biology major. Tell me about this history professor. Those are the people we're trying to connect with. Tell me about that mathematics professor that's back there. Yeah. That's where our connections are being made. And for the outstanding students that are out there in the state of Arkansas, that's what they're looking for. They're wanting to know that somebody cares about them, that they're more than just a number. And if you can connect people to people, that personal touch, it goes a long way. Sharon and I are members of a very large church in Jonesboro. Our church has, we've grown from about 2,500 members to over 5,700 members in the last six years. You can imagine the fact that so many people in that church know that I work at ASU. You can imagine the phone calls we get. Mostly very positive phone calls. But we're constantly working and asking, thinking and asking ourselves, how do we continue to make certain that the university is being advanced and promoted? How do we make certain that our message is getting through, that we're offering more than what other universities can offer? But again, the core of any marketing campaign is a student-centered environment that we're trying to create, but at the foundation of that environment is the strength of our academic programs and the quality of our faculty. And those two have to go hand in hand, and those two have to be promoted. When I look at your website, it's a good website, but my wife and I were out walking this morning, and at 5.30 this morning, I can't remember the kid's name, but he led us into the uh, fitness center. His last name was Jones, that's right. He's a baseball player, third baseman, yes. And he led us in, and he gave us a tour, super, super kid. But there should be pictures of that place and videos all over your website. That's a great attraction. You have some very attractive student housing. And we may have to tell freshmen, you don't get to live there this year, and that's what we did at ASU. They don't get to live in the new stuff, except unless you're an honor student. But the other students, you don't get to live in the new housing. But if you come and stay with us for a year, you'll spend the next three, four, five years with us <laughs> in a very, very nice place. But the way we present the campus, because if I didn't know Henderson, it comes across one way. 
But I think how we present ourselves, how we cast a spotlight on our people, how we tell that story. Uh, when I look at Henderson, uh, you don't do like an annual report telling people all the great things that are going on. Uh, we just completed our first uh, research report back in October. And just letting, telling the stories of our researchers and the great things that they're doing. And somebody had this neat idea, hey, let's, let's embed one of those USB codes. And when you scan it with your phone, it pops up a video. And now suddenly you're listening to Dr. Uh, Brandon Kemp talk about his research, which is simply phenomenal. And Brandon Kemp is going to be one of the rising stars in physics moving forward. But here's a young man, PhD from MIT. He was head of corporate research with Lexmark, which is the division of IBM. He's a former ASU alum. And we talked Brandon into coming home into higher ed. Phenomenally talented young man. We've built a web of support around him. He just received a National Science Foundation Career Award, first time out, which is unheard of. And he's going to do some very great things. And here in about a month, we've got a very significant donor that we're going to put in before. Because he's got some great ideas. And there's no way we could ever afford to fund those ideas here internally. But the idea of connecting people and the passions they have with people who are passionate about the university and supporting our activities is very important. And that's really the heart of a capital campaign. And any campaign that we do here is going to be built around and centered upon the people that we have. And again, I think there are just some phenomenal stories that are waiting to be told here, from teaching, from service, to research, to advising. And I think it's just a matter of positioning ourselves to tell that story articulating exactly who we are so we understand that going forward. But also it's going to take us reaching out and building a lot of friendships and asking for a lot of support. And Henderson has a lot of great friends, and I think it's going to be important that we really reach out to those friends and invite them back into the university. And while we may be thinking idea Y, they may be thinking idea H. And we're going to listen. And let's see what makes sense. And let's see where those opportunities lie. And let's see where they're willing to come in and invest our time, effort, and resources into this university. And again, I think we have the opportunity to create something that's truly transformative here. I think Henderson's greatest strength right now is the fact that you have a very compassionate, a very caring, and a very sharp faculty. And the fact that when a student comes here, you're going to know them by name. The fact that I can stand here over 20 years later and look at a lot of these faces and still have a lot of fond memories, for the most part, Mr. Gardner, <coughs> I have a lot of fun, fond memories, says a lot about you and the character of this institution and the character of the people within this institution. I could ask one more question. Um, You'll have to deal with the legislature uh, a good bit uh, for funding issues and, and so forth. Um, I mean, what do you think your skills are there? I mean, because as you well know, the legislature comes up with some pretty harebrained ideas at times. For example, there's a proposal to... This is being recorded, you know. I don't care. I don't care. I would say it in front of, of anybody. Um, for example, one idea to enroll a student in a remedial course, like intermediate algebra, at the same time they're taking college algebra. So anyway, I guess not, not, not to address that specific issue, but just, you know, how are you positioned, what are your skills as far as dealing with um, the Arkansas legislature? We work with them a lot now. In my current capacity, I do a lot of the federal work. We also work together at the state level. And we, as a team, we have a coordinated effort that's organized out of our system in Little Rock. Robert Evans is our leg chief legislative officer. And what we try to do is that we take a proactive approach and we're consistently educating our legislators on what our needs are. But also, we're continuously demonstrating to them the value that we give back to the state of Arkansas, but also we take the time to recognize their work and appreciate the things that they're doing. Being a legislator is a very thankless job. You're forced to balance the budget, which is a good thing. But when you're looking at weighing the needs of K-12, which you're fundamentally obligated to do, you're looking at social services, you're looking at prisons, you're looking at higher ed, it's a difficult job. 
Also in higher ed, we have to understand that many of our legislators are not educated people. They don't hold college degrees. And so I think the approach we take to them when we hear something, I'm using her term, that's, <laughs> but we hear something that's, when we hear something that's off the wall, it's important that we, I, I know I just refuse to say the other word. But when we hear something that's off the wall, it's important that we take what's being said and we sit down with them and really articulate in response that we hear what you're saying, but there's really a better way to bring this about. And that's what we did with performance funding. Performance funding was all over the place. And we had to sit down with the room of legislators and just say, look, we know what you're trying to do, but we cannot give away a degree. Well, we're not asking you to do that. Well, the implication is pretty strong here, and there's a strong inference, whether it's intended or not. That's not appropriate. And to the legislators that I know, and there are many, they're our friends, they're our neighbors, we go to church together, we shop at Walmart together, we do all these things together. And the key is to maintain that relationship year round. And that we're educating and informing them year round. That we're getting them on our campuses. Because they may have a bad idea for you or me, but I want them to talk to the students. I want them to hear their stories. I want them to understand that we are transforming the lives of students each and every day. And the work that we're doing is important, it is significant, and it is vital to the success of our state. And so that ability to work with them and interact and engage, that's something I do a lot of. Um, the ability to really, again, articulate and really help them understand what's really taking place. And for example, why do you people keep raising tuition? Because you keep cutting our appropriation. Why do you keep cutting our appropriation? Because you keep raising tuition. <clears throat> so, okay, time out. Let's really think this through. But having them understand that we have needs that we're having to address, and we don't want to make higher ed unaffordable for our students. Nobody wants to do that. But at the same time, we've got faculty who deserve to be paid more. At the same time, we've got facilities that need to be improved and enhanced. At the same time, while the lottery scholarship is a great idea, we're bringing in more students, but we weren't given any additional dollars to, to service those students appropriately as they began to emerge into Arkansas higher education. But being able to sit down with them and really explain and share with them, these are the kind of impacts your decisions are having on us. And if you go down the road with a certain decision, here's the impact we're going to have. We have a governor who's probably been the best friend of higher education in a long, long time. We've had some very good friends of higher education in the governor's office. But I think Governor Beebe probably gets it very well. Not probably, he does get it very well. He's trying to draw that link between economic development and education. I think he's put his money where his mouth is in terms of supporting higher ed. But I'll, I'm always quick to remind everybody, though, this is about as bad as it can get economically, what we've endured the past few years, the greatest depression since the Great Depression. And as a result, if we can just hold on a little bit longer, if we can continue to just uh, cast a vision and stay the course, I think we'll emerge from this a better university. But I also think we'll emerge from this position to maybe not quite give you that double your pay, but hopefully make a, a significant contribution towards enhancing the salaries of our faculty on this campus. It is time for closing <coughs> remarks. My closing remark is very simple. Number one, thank you all for allowing me to be here. It's truly a humbling experience to stand before people who have influenced my life in so many ways. If I were to be blessed enough to become president of Henderson State University, I want to make a couple of commitments to you. Number one, I will listen. I recognized an hour and a half interview with the search committee and spending two days on campus and reading through their website and, and every other piece of information uh, Ms. Flora Weeks was kind enough to send to me does not make me an authority on this campus. I want to understand and appreciate the culture. I want to hear your passions. I want to hear your ideas. I want to understand the concerns that you have. When things are great, I'm going to communicate. When things are not so great, I'm going to communicate. That dialogue will be open. Shared governance is not something I say to earn a brownie point here and there. It's something I truly believe in. I'm not the smartest person in my own house, let alone the smartest person on this campus. I recognize that there are people here who are brilliant. 
and collectively we can make far better decisions than any one person or group of people can in isolation. It's very important to me. If we come here, if you guys were to call us here, I will build an administrative team that's highly competent, consists of men with incredible character, and they will be very compatible with the culture of Henderson. They themselves will be servant leaders. They will understand that we're here to serve. They will value shared governance. And they will support the ideals and principles that I've talked about here today. It's very important for me. Likewise, I will work to earn your respect. I'll work even harder to keep your confidence. I will not do anything anything that would hurt the integrity of this institution or cause embarrassment upon her, the faculty, staff, or students. But more than anything else, I think my family and I could work with you all to develop that shared vision that would feed a strategic plan that would position this university not to be like ASU or UCA or anyone else, but to be the best Henderson that we can be. And in so doing, other universities will want to be like us. I think that's the opportunity we have before us. The opportunity to make a difference is simply incredible. But I'll leave you with two quotes. The first quote goes something like this. If you want to build a ship, don't ask people to bring you wood and don't give them tasks or assignments to complete, but inspire within them an abiding love for the deep immensity of the sea. And William Osler, who was one of the founding Fathers of St. John, sorry, from John, for Johns Hopkins University back in the late 1800s, early 1800s, late 18, mid to late 1800s, became frustrated with what was happening in medical education. He didn't like the way the young physicians were learning. He didn't think that medicine was doing all that it could do to really promote the profession itself. And so one day he said, you know, the kind of education that need, that's needed today is not the kind that's given in the classroom. It's not the kind that can be bought or sold in the marketplace. It has to be wrought in each individual for himself because it is the silent influence of character on character. The silent influence of character on character. Students come here seeking a degree. They will leave this place transformed individuals because of your character and because of the influence we've had on them over the time that we've had them with us. Henderson is a very special place and it holds a very near and dear place in my heart. And I can only hope that my wife and I would have the opportunity to serve you in this new capacity. So again, on behalf of Sharon and I, thank you all for being so gracious to us and giving us an opportunity to come and share with you about ourselves and what we think we can offer this wonderful university. Thank you.